This time I'll call to order the April 15, 2024 Community Redevelopment Agency meeting. I'd like to welcome everyone for attending this afternoon. This time I'll move to item two on the agenda. Are there any, any amendments to the minutes of the March 18, 2024 CRA meeting? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Moved and seconded that we approve the minutes as presented. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. This time we'll move to item three on the agenda, citizens to be heard regarding items not on the agenda. Are there any citizens which wish which, which, which to be heard? Good afternoon, I'm Kathleen Beckman, Clearwater resident. Um, I wanna take a minute and congratulate the new members uh, for your election and your first CRA meeting. Um, and uh, wanted to let you know I continue to serve as chair of the Pinellas County Continuum of Care. So I may be up here speaking to you about those types of um, issues. Um, but I'm here today for three items related to the CRA. Uh, and um, as you know, I mean, as a resident, I will continue to advocate for our residents in Clearwater as well as good governance. And that's kind of why I'm here today. I would, uh, three things I want to suggest to you related to your job, your position as, um, as uh, the board of the CRA. Uh, number one is I would suggest that you allocate funds from our general fund for operation of the CRA. To me, to talk about the $5 million that was set aside to jumpstart the North Green Greenwood CRA and utilize those funds to fund staffing for the CRA is not appropriate. Number one, they're not long-term funds. And number two, those ARPA funds were distributed from the federal government in response to COVID for particular things. It just happened that it coincided with our um, approval of that North Greenwood CRA. And so every other city has line item budgets, especially for brand new CRAs, to get that CRA going. You, I think we need to have a line item budget from general funds for the North Greenwood CRA. Um, especially because we're waiting for an opinion from the Attorney General about the flow through of funds from the downtown CRA into the North Greenwood CRA. I feel that they're getting short, shorted by not having a budget item for their first full year in existence. So that's one thing. The other thing is I would, I applaud our city for having dashboards and continuing to bring more dashboards online. I would suggest that we get a CRA dashboard up as soon as possible. Uh, we have a grassroots group in North Greenwood that is excited about what's going on and wanting to see progress. We've had some changes in the downtown property uh, recently, as well as conversations about um, perhaps using CRA funds to buy county buildings. I think we need a dashboard set up uh, as soon as possible for our CRA. And then the third one, uh, I would say, is the director's report on the agenda. I would suggest that we have at least some bullets about what's going to be covered in our director's report if citizens want to come and speak on those. And some of the things that need to be included in the dashboard are probably included in um, Jesus's report. That would be grant updates, police report updates, statistics on new businesses, what new businesses are coming, what new businesses have left, um, the balance of the funds, and an update on how those conversations are going between our city and county groups that are talking about those properties. That's what people care about, and I would urge you to be transparent about that. Thank you. Are there any other citizens to be heard on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move to item 4.1. Amend the loan to grant agreement with 949 Cleveland Street, LLC, for the property at 943 Cleveland Street to accept the agreement to July 15, 2024, for building improvements to implement the CRA food and drink grant program and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. Good morning, or afternoon now, I'm sorry. Uh, for the public and for the new council members, or Trustees here, my name is Jesus Nino. I am the executive director for the Clearwater Community Redevelopment Agency. Uh, this item before you is a fifth amendment request for a loan to grant agreement with 
949 Cleveland Street, LLC, for property located at 943 Cleveland Street, basically to extend, extend the agreement to July 15, 2024, for building improvements to implement the CRA Food and Drink Grant Program and authorize appropriate officials to execute the same. Uh, this program was created by the trustees or approved by the trustees back in October of 2018. Uh, this particular company uh, requested grant funding for this program back in February 18, 2020, and it was approved by the trustees. This was during the COVID time, so they requested a few amendments to extend this particular grant program on their property. This is the fifth one, and this one in particular, the reason for it is they did lose their tenant that they had originally there, uh, but they have a new tenant in place now, and they also discovered a few issues during their remodeling there of the, the space, which was electrical work that needed to be upgraded according to inspectors. So I did take a tour out there with Bridget, who's out here in the audience, and she'll say a few words if you allow her after I'm done here. And it looks like they're right there at the finish line. They just need a little bit more time to go ahead and finish up this space so they can go ahead and get their tenant inside and just get to operations and become an asset there to Cleveland Street. And I do encourage all of you to go out there and get you a cup of coffee once they are open. Uh, with that, staff is requesting approval of this uh, fifth extension. I'm here for questions. And also, Ms. Bridget Johnson, the general manager, is here in addition to answering any questions. Are there any citizens that wish to be heard on this item? Hearing none, council? Any discussion? I just wanted to make a comment. I've been following the progress, and I acknowledge that I know it's a long time, and there's been many uh, requests for renewal, but they've really faced um, sizable challenges and through no fault of their own, so I, I'm in support of this. Any other questions? Vice Mayor? Yeah. Uh, so I, too, have been following this for a few years, and I know they uh, had problems uh, really getting it off the ground. I think it was in the middle of COVID, uh, set them back, and then, of course, the roof stuff that that they had, and now the electrical. Um, so this delay is, are they going to be pretty much finished by the time, by this summer? I mean, is that, are you They're, looking yes. for? Their request was actually to June, but we recommended to get them an extension to July, just in case. But as far as um, them grand openings and so forth, Ms. Bridget is here to answer those particular questions, and I think they'll be done by then. Okay. I mean, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I wish them the best. I hope they, I really hope they do open in June or July. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing that happen. Thanks. Any other discussion? Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve 4.1. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Unanimous. Move to item five, director's report. Again, for the public, Jesus Nino, executive director for the Clearwater CRA. Uh, this particular item, uh, continuing uh, starting next month, we are going to have a presentation basically outlining what we're doing over in North Greenwood plus the downtown. Uh, we did have one started for this particular month, but I didn't think it was ready enough to bring it to you uh, to be acceptable. But next month, we'll be doing that. In addition, I just want to let the group know here is that we are uh, going through a new web page design, working with Joelle's group here, uh, she's with Public Communications, to redo the website, the web section for the Clearwater CRA. And that web page, we will have dashboards for our revenues, our programs, and any other items that we feel appropriate that the trustees and the general public needs to know about. And we're all about transparency, especially me. So we want to put as much information out there without making it look cluttered for the general public and for the trustees. So if you ever want to know where we are in our finances, our budget, you can quickly go there and find it quickly. So can the public want to find out our, about our grants and programs, they can go there quickly and find it as well. It, just be transparent and have a one-stop location for the public and 
all of you as well. So a lot of these requests that you're asking us to bring to you every month, it'll just be right there at your fingertips every month. So that's for the website. Uh, before I move forward, I did want to introduce the CRA team and the DDB team to the new trustees and the rest of you if you haven't met them. And they are here, and I'm going to ask them to stand up. So we have Ms. Ann Lopez. She's a senior CRA division manager. Ms. Vicki Shire, she's actually out um, this week, but she's here in spirit. <laughs> Mr. Eric Santiago, he's a CRA manager. Ms. Tasha Hadley, she's a CRA specialist. Then we have Julia uh, Bautas, she's also a CRA specialist. And this is a dream team. Uh, without them, I couldn't do what I'm doing here for the citizens of Clearwater and for all of you, the trustees. Uh, as far as me, I, I just want to let you know that my door is always open. You can give me a call anytime. I, I do follow protocol, so if, if you have to go through the city manager first, she'll let me know that, but if not, uh, you can contact me anytime and I'm just here for you day or night, so feel free to give me a call or email me. As far as a few other updates, I did want to let the public know and the trustees know that at the last trustees meeting, we did approve policy bylaws basically for the new North Greenwood Citizens Advisory Committee. So we have created a communications plan and engagement plan to go ahead and try to do that outreach to recruit new CAC members. And we do have a flyer that we did send out on social media and so forth uh, for the Citizens Advisory Committee. So anyone out there in the public who's listening, if you're in the North Greenwood area, you're a resident, a business owner, a property owner, or work for a nonprofit or other organizations out there in North Greenwood area, feel free to contact us if you're interested in serving on the advisory committee. Second one is that we do have a, on April the 24th, this is for the East Gateway downtown CRA area. We have a community meeting to discuss with the community the Mercado project, the construction project. It's just, we're just gonna be out there from 6 to 7 p.m. We'll be there with Public Works, with Parks and Rec, with the contractor, just to discuss the construction of the Mercado and just answer any questions. And if there's any potential disruption, who they can contact from the city. So hopefully some of you can make it. Again, that's April 24th. 6 to 7 p.m. at the Lucas Restaurant and Bar at 1343 Cleveland Street. So if anyone from the public has any questions, feel free to contact staff. As far as that, that's the reports. I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions for the director or any discussion? Just have one question. none, thank you for your time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Mr. Yeah. I had one, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, have you had a chance to um, reach or have any contact with the new owners of 530 yet? Say it again? 530. Have you had any uh, had an opportunity to meet with the new owners of 530, which is the corner of Cleveland and Garden? I or any of your staff? I can see if staff can come up here and answer that question. I've met with so many people and so yeah, many I organizations. Ann <laughs> Lopez. Ann Lopez, Senior CRA Manager. I actually, we met with them last week. Um, I know that they are the owners of Graham's Gourmet across the street. We're very much looking forward to them. They have kind of a long road ahead of them with some of the repairs that they need to do within the space. But we did sit down, talk with them about what some of those would look like and how the grant programs that we currently have for the CRA could kind of tie in for what they're looking for. So they've started their process on um, reaching out to get quotes through contractors so but yes we have met with them they're they're very excited perfect thank yes. you so much You're welcome yeah. any other questions for the director i thank you for your time today thank you this time we'll adjourn the meeting of the community redevelopment agency This time I'll call to order the April 15, 2024 Pension Trustees meeting. We'll move to item 2.1 on the agenda.
Are there any amendments to the minutes of the meeting of February 12, 2023? Move to approve agenda item 2.1. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? Item 3 in the agenda is citizens to be heard regarding items not on the agenda. Seeing no citizens that wish to be heard, we'll move to item 4. Point one on the agenda. Uh, trustees, items, I would like a motion to continue items 4.1 through 4.3, and that is because the Pension Advisory Committee have not had an opportunity to review those items, so um, any approval right now is not needed from pension trustees. If you can continue it to the next meeting. Which one again, sorry? Items 4.1 through 4.3. I make a motion to continue items 4.1 through 4.3 to uh, next next week times meeting. I'll second it. Okay. Move to continue items 4.1 through 4.3 to the next meeting of the pension trustees. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Item 4.4. Annual review of the employee's pension plan investment performance for the calendar and plan year that ended December 31, 2023. Good afternoon, trustees. Jay Ravens, finance director. This is an annual review of investment performance for the plan. Before I begin to review the calendar 2023 results, I'd like to provide a, a little background. The pension plan has an investment committee that meets quarterly to review investment performance with the city's investment consultant, Cap Trust Advisors. The committee consists of city staff, union representatives, and one citizen appointed by the trustees. The city staff members currently include the finance director, assistant finance director, and the finance accounting manager. Each of the unions is invited to participate, and currently CWA and IAFF are actively participating. The investment committee makes recommendations to the trustees for money manager terminations and hires, as well as investment <coughs> policy changes. With that, um, like to now briefly review the plan's investment performance, including the performance of the total investment portfolio versus the plan's policy benchmark, as well as each of the 22 separate money managers for the various asset classes. The first two columns on this chart provide the calendar year performance values versus the benchmark. The middle two columns provide three year performance on an annualized basis and the last two columns provide similar five-year performance re results. I'll briefly review. Please interrupt me at any time with questions. Overall, for the plan in total, it was a very good year on both an absolute basis with a gain of 13.46%. This is versus the plan's assumption of 6.5%. And on a relative basis, as we outperformed our policy benchmark index of 11.42%. All asset categories had a good year, with the exception of the real estate sector, which continues to suffer from the impact of vacant office space and declining appraised values. Calendar 2023 was a very nice rebound from an unusual 2022, when both equities and fixed income were simultaneously down significantly resulting in a negative 14.9% return versus this year's positive 13.46. I'll now briefly run through the 22 money managers. Our large cap growth money manager, the Northern Trust Index Fund, performed close to the index as expected with a 42.2% return for the year. This manager was hired in November 2020, so the five-year performance is not available. We have three large cap value managers, Eagle Capital, Manning and Napier, and the Northern Trust Index Fund. Eagle Capital had an excellent year, excuse me, had an excellent year with a 38% return versus an index of 11%. 
Eagle rebounded from a poor year last year, a negative 25% return, which was primarily due to being underweight in the energy sector for 2022. Despite U.S. stocks in total being down by a negative 18% in 2022, the energy sector was up 65%. Any money manager significantly underweight to the index in this single sector in 2022 underperformed significantly versus the index. This is a good example of the volatility in investment manager returns from year to year, which is why we focus on long-term performance and whether managers are staying true to the investment discipline that we hired them for. Manning and Nipier provided a 10% return for the year, but underperformed their index for the calendar year for the last three years and for the last five years. The investment committee recently decreased the plan's investment in Manning and Napier by 15 million or 35% and continues to monitor performance for further action as appropriate. The Northern Trust Index Large Cap Value Fund performed at the index for all three time periods as expected with an 11.6% return for the year. We have one mid-cap growth manager, Artisan Partners. Artisan slightly underperformed their index for the current year, but provided a 25% return. Their three-year performance significantly underperformed the index due to being underweight to the energy sector in 2022, similar to Eagle Capital discussed previously. Their five-year performance was slightly better than the index. Artisan continues to stay true to the investment process that we hired them for, and we expect them to continue to outperform on a long-term basis. Our mid-cap value manager, Boston Partners, provided a 16.7% return for the year and outperformed their index for both the one year and the three year. Five, per, five year performance is not available due to hiring them in April, 2020. Our small cap growth manager, Riverbridge Park Partners, provided a 20% return for the year and outperformed on both a one year and five year basis. Their underperformance on the three year measure was due to poor performance in 20. 22, due to, once again, being significantly underweight in the energy sector. We have two small cap value managers, Atlanta Capital and Victory Sycamore. Atlanta Capital provided a 20.7% return for the year and has had excellent performance for the one year, three year, and five year periods. Victory Sycamore had a down year performing with an 11.55% return versus their index of 14.65, but continues to outperform for both the three year and five year periods. We have two international equity managers that invest in developed countries, WCM and TSNW. Both had excellent absolute returns for the year, 16 and 17% respectively. Both underperformed for the three year period due to poor performance in 2022, but both continue to outperform for the five year period. We expect their long-term outperformance to continue. We have one emerging markets international equity manager, DFA. DFA provided a 15% return for the year and has outperformed on all three measures. We have two fixed income managers, Dodge & Cox and Western Asset Management. Dodge & Cox provided a 7% 7, 7 return for the year and has outperformed the index on all three measures. Western Asset Management provided a 6% return, outperforming the index. They have slightly underperformed for the three-year period and slightly outperformed for the five year. We have no concerns with either of these managers at this time. Our real estate core manager, multi-employer multi property trust or MEPT 
had a negative 16% return for the year and has underperformed their index for all three time periods. The investment committee continues to closely monitor this manager and has requested redemption of 50% of our investment or 30 million. This request was made in May of 2023 and we remain on a redemption wait queue. We have two core plus real estate managers, Intercontin Intercontinental and Affinius Capital, previously USAA. Intercontinental had a negative 16% return for the year and has similar, similarly underperformed their index for all three time periods. The committee is closely monitoring their performance also for future action as appropriate. Affinius had a negative 7.85% return for the year but has significantly outperformed the index for the one year, three year, and five year periods. We have one real estate REIT manager, Security Capital. Security Capital provided a 15.7% positive return for the year. They slightly underperformed on the one year and three year basis, but continue to outperform for the five year. No, no concerns with this manager's performance at this time. The plan participates in three timber limited partnerships, one with Hancock and two with Mulpus. Hancock had a negative 0.43% return for the year, while the two Mulpus partnerships provided 2.41% and 3.55% returns. Hancock has underperformed the index for all three time periods, while Mulpus has provided some outperformance. These limited partnerships terminate in four to seven years. Finally, we have one infrastructure money manager, IFM Global Infrastructure. IFM provided an 8.4% return for the year, but had a tough year relative to their very strong index of 23.8%. This significant one year underperformance also caused them to underperform for the five year period. The three year period still reflects significant outperformance and we're very pleased with the absolute average annual return of 10% over the last five years. In summary, we continue to carefully monitor the performance of all these money managers on a quarterly basis with the assistance of the plan's investment consultant, CAP Trust Advisors, with an emphasis on long-term performance of the managers versus their respective indexes and adherence to the management styles that we hired them for, we will continue to provide the trustees with recommendations for terminations and replacement as appropriate. On a separate note, the investment committee will be bringing you a recommendation in the coming months to hire our first private credit money manager. Per the analysis, per the analysis it appears this new alternative asset category could enhance the diversification of the portfolio and thereby reduce the volatility of our returns from year to year. I'll have more information on for that topic when I bring that agenda item forward. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Ravens? It's a lot of numbers. <laughs> no? Thank you. you Thank you. I'm going to move to item 4.5 on the agenda. Appoint an individual to the Pension Investment Committee with a term to expire April 18, 2026. Trustees, um, the committee is responsible, uh, as Mr. Ravens just mentioned, of the oversight of the pension plan investments and provides recommendations to the trustees regarding asset allocation and even um, the hiring and firing of money managers. So in your agenda pack, you have applications for two individuals, um, John Connolly, who is a retired financial consulting management, um, and Carrie Green, um, who is a financial planner. Vice Mayor Earl Britton. I'm gonna suggest John Conley for this position. I've known him and he's, uh, I think he would be an asset to us in this position. I agree. Any other discussion? To motion by Vice Mayor Albritton to appoint Mr. Connolly to the Pension Investment Committee. Is there a second? Second. 
All in favor? Wait, one Aye. second. Can we have a... Uh, oh, excuse me. Open it to the public, yeah. please. Yeah. Are there any citizens to be heard on this agenda item? Yeah. Seeing none, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Item number five on the agenda, old business items. Oh, my God. Okay. With that, we will adjourn the meeting of the pension trustees. We will. Oh, this one. Oh, my. Yeah, one time. Clock's off. Okay, yeah. we'll go ahead. I'll call to order the April 15, 2024 Clearwater City Council work session. I can like to welcome everyone here this afternoon, including all the staff who are in attendance. Move to item 2.1 on the agenda. Approve the local housing assistance plan for fiscal year 2024 through 2025. Uh, thank you, Chuck Lane, Economic Development Housing Department. So as a recipient of state housing initiative partnership funding every year, uh, we're required to submit a local housing assistance plan every three years. The, uh, the LHAP, as we call it, um, is our guiding document for our use of SHIP funds. Uh, the, uh, the current LHAP expires on June 30th, and the new one will begin on July 1, which is the beginning of the state fiscal year. The proposed LHAP has eight strategies. Um, two of them are new. Six of the strategies are continuing from the current LHAP, uh, with some changes to each. <clears throat> All of the changes we're proposing are, are really based on two things. One, we're trying to have some consistency with programs administered by other local governments. Uh, but more importantly, we're trying to respond to market conditions. Um, if market conditions change during the life of this plan, um, we have the ability to make changes to stay current with market needs. So to explain the changes uh, to the existing strategies, um, <clears throat> we've increased the maximum loan to a developer for acquisition and construction for single family homes from $200,000 in the current plan to $300,000 in the proposed plan. We're also increasing their developer fee, the developer fee from 12% to 15%. Um, we've increased uh, home buyer purchase assistance loans from $45,000 to $75,000. That equals the county's maximum loan uh, under their program. We're also increasing the deferral period, uh, a period for which they don't have to make payments uh, for, for households with incomes up to 50% of area median income and below, so very low income households. Uh, the current LHAP has that deferral period of five years with repayment of 50% of, of the loan over the following, uh, tw uh, over the following 20 years. Uh, the new LHAP will have the loan 100% deferred for the 25 year term of the loan. For eligible buyers over 50% of area median income and up to 120% of area median income, will continue to provide a five-year deferral period with 50% uh, repayment over the remaining term, okay? Um, our owner-occupied rehabilitation loan program, that's a, a staple in, in our programs, it will continue to provide up to $60,000 uh, for eligible improvements. In addition, uh, the new LHAP provides up to $15,000 in additional grant funding for ADA improvements for qualifying households with special needs. Um, other changes under the program, including uh, increasing the income limit for the 100% deferral period. Uh, we're proposing all, all borrowers up to 80% of AMI have a deferred loan. Um, and, uh, and for homeowners with incomes between 80% AMI and 120% AMI, we're proposing to uh, continue to provide a 120-day deferral period. That would be the construction process. Um, and 50% of the loan will be repaid over the remaining term of the loan, okay? Um, for multifamily housing, the maximum loan amount per unit for acquisition or new construction increases from $150,000 per unit to $200,000 per unit. For rehab, rehabilitation of multifamily units, the maximum increases from $50,000 to $100,000 per unit. Uh, and we're not required to go to these maximums. Just wanna make sure you're aware of that. And rather than a minimum 30-year term, we're proposing uh, a little flexibility there, 20 to 30-year terms, depending on the financial outlook of the property, of the project. 
Uh, the, the last uh, existing strategy that we're continuing is a disaster assistance. Uh, we don't fund this, this, uh, this strategy if there is a disaster that affects housing. The Florida Housing Finance Corporation will very likely distribute funding uh, to help households that have been damaged. Under this strategy, we will, we will fund grants for home repairs up to $20,000. This is an increase from the current limit of $10,000. Uh, eligibility uh, remains at incomes up to 80% of area median income for this strategy. So the two new strategies, one of them is uh, demolition, reconstruct, uh, relocation, and construction. So in our rehab program, we, we you know, oftentimes we, we find homes that are just too far gone to repair with the maximum benefit under our rehab program. Um, so we're just unable to help. Um, we're proposing to provide loans up to $200,000 to tear down a home and, and disrepair and build a new home on the same lot. It's a strategy we had years ago in Clearwater. We haven't had it for some time. Um, loans will be deferred for households below 50% 80 80, below of area median income, and for others, we'll amortize 50% of the loan over 20 years. Additionally, we'll, provo we'll propose um, providing up to $25,000 in di direct pay grant funding for relocation assistance. And, uh, and storage fees. Lastly, we've added a rental assistance strategy. Um, we won't administer this program internally. It's far too staff intensive. Um, but if we, if we have a nonprofit that's willing and capable of doing so, we, we have the ability to partner. Uh, eligible expenditures will be deposits, rent arrears, utilities, and up to six months of rental payments with a cumulative, cumulative max benefit of $10,000. So once approved, we'll be able to submit this plan to the state. We'll submit it by the May 2nd deadline. Uh, they've given us preliminary approval, so I don't anticipate any issues with our submittal. So with that, I'll take questions, please. Any questions for Mr. Lane? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you. See you Thursday. Consent? It can't go on consent. It's an administrative public can't. hearing item. Okay. That's right. I need to look at after the, uh, in the parentheses. Right. So <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. With that, we'll move to item 3.1. Authorized purchase orders to control Southern Inc. of Suwannee, Georgia. DevTech Sales of Avon Park Equipment Controls Company of Norcross, Georgia. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, Jam Tech Incorporated of Malabar, Florida. Um, all for natural gas meters and regulators. Good afternoon, Council Members. Catherine Neely, Clearwater Gas Systems Division Controller. Uh, Clearwater Gas System requests to authorize the purchase orders for the uh, purchase of natural gas meters and regulators. All meters and regulators are used on the Clearwater Gas System for new customers, replacements, and changeouts within the system as necessary. As part of bid 15-24, we are requesting to award to Control Southern, DevTech Sales, Equipment Controls, GemTech, and Merco in a not to exceed amount of 1.3 million. With that, we also are requesting that to ensure the continuity of supply, uh, flexibility to order from secondary source. I can answer any questions at this time. Any questions from the council? Hearing none, consent? Yes. Unanimous. Item 4.1. Approve the second amendment between the City of Clearwater and International City Management Association Retirement Corporation doing business as Mission Square Retirement. Good afternoon, everyone. Jill Paul, HR Manager. As uh, previously stated, I'm here to request the approval of the second amendment between the City of Clearwater and the International City Management Association Retirement Corporation, ICMARC, doing business as Mission Square Retirement to provide administrative services as the administrator of the city's 401A purchase pension plan and the voluntary 457 deferred pension, de deferred compensation plan for, for the term June 1st, 2024 through May 31st, 2029. Mission Square currently administers the city's 401A plan and the voluntary 457 deferred compensation program. The 401A money purchase plan is funded by city contributions on behalf of participants and is provided to those hired into exempt management positions that do not qualify for enrollment in the defined benefit pension plan. 
the voluntary 457 deferred compensation plan is funded by plan participants. Mission Square has approached the city with a proposed fee reduction for plan participants from the current 0.049% to 0.039% in exchange for a new five-year agreement, equating to a 20.4% decrease in the fee. The city retains the right to terminate the agreement at any time with 90 days written notice. Staff is very pleased with the level of administrative services and employee support provided by Mission Square and recommends the approval of the five-year agreement to take advantage of significant fee reductions for employees and plan participants. Seeking a new vendor at this time would cause a significant disruption to employees as employees would need to transition and set up new accounts which recently occurred in 2019. That transition process took approximately four to six months. For these reasons, the purchase is practical to bid. At the end of the five-year renewal, staff does intend to issue a new RFP. Questions? Any questions from the council? Hearing none, do we have consent? Yes. yes. Unanimous, thank you. <laughs> Move to item 5.1. Award, per award purchase orders to Quality Sod and Landscape LLC, Sunbelt Sod and Grading Company and Tom Sod Service for Citywide Sod Needs. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Art Cater, Parks and Recreation Director. The item before you today is for the purchase and installation uh, services for the sod material, uh, which is used throughout the city by several different departments. Parks and Recreation obviously is the largest purchaser of the sod because we use them for parks, ball fields, medians, and also new projects. Uh, we are recommending three different vendors to supply the various varieties of sod needed throughout the year. Uh, and that way we have the availability of sod, to be quite honest with you, and flexibility when we, when we need it. Obviously these so, uh, sod fields, they'll get flooded out and then you don't have any sod and you got, so you gotta have someone else to go to. So that's basically it. I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Cater? No. Hearing none, consent? Yep. Yes. Unanimous. Item <clears throat> 5.2. Authorize a guaranteed maximum price proposal to Keystone Excavators for pavement milling and resurfacing at six parks and recreation facilities. Yes, our Cater Parks and Recreation Director. This item is really for the resurfacing repair of six of our uh, parks parking lots, as well as resurfacing a trail and installation of some sidewalk that we have at Sewell Road Park. We have several um, maintenance capital improvement projects within Parks and Recreation. And this is just one of those CIP projects that we annually look at. We go over playgrounds is one of them, fencing is another one. So this is just for basically the parking lots, asphalt, and sidewalks. The contract will provide resurfacing and repair work at Country Hollow Park, Forest Run Park, Glen Oaks Park, Phillip Jones Park, Sewell Road Park, and Woodgate Park. Contracts for 180 days, but we're hopeful that it'll be done sooner than that, depending upon the weather. I'm available for any questions. Yeah. Any questions for Mr. Cater? Hearing none, do we have consent? Yes. yes. Yep. Unanimous. Item 5.3. Authorize a guaranteed maximum price proposal to service builders for professional construction services to include the final design and subsequent construction of the new structural and surface improvements at 201 Glenwood. Yes, our Cater Parks and Recreation Director. This item is for the expansion of a metal canopy at the Crest Lake Park uh, and other items related to that movement and the improvements of the basically the maintenance yard that we have out there, expansion of fencing and also installation of some concrete. A few years ago um, at Crest Lake Park, as you all know, we underwent a major renovation or completion of a redesign of the park. The addition of several new components, basically it was a playground, splash pad, volleyball courts, walking trails and bridges, a new uh, an arboretum, a restrooms, parking, and landscaping. In the active area of the park where we have the restroom and where we have the splash pad, we also put in there a maintenance yard uh, for all of our staff that works out of that. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, we, we put some uh, a covering over all of the pool equipment or the equipment for the splash pad, but we uh, did not put the equipment uh, or uh, this metal building, it's called a skillion, I knew that, 
Well, somebody calls it a port -a but that's not that because you've got to <laughs> drive up to that. But it's a skilly and building. So in hindsight, we really should have put this metal structure over the area where we have uh, keep all of our maintenance vehicles. Right now, they're out in the weather, to be quite honest with you. We cover them up, but this will allow to protect that area. Um, the, um, also know that we've expanded the maintenance teams, as you know, working at Coachman Park. Uh, they actually maintain Coachman Park all the way through Cleveland Street and that little section of Gulf to Bay all the way up to Crest Lake Park. So the team has expanded. We don't have any maintenance yards down here in the park, so we're using Crest Lake Park for that purpose as well. So I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Kahn? Hearing none, do we have consent? Yes. yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kahn. Moved item 6.1. Approve the annexation initial future land use map designation, residential low, and initial zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential for 1485 Grove Circle Court. Thank you, Colorado Brotherton Planning and Development. This voluntary annexation petition involves a 0 0.233 acre property consisting of one parcel of land occupied by a detached dwelling. The applicant is requesting annexation in order to receive sanitary sewer and solid waste service from the city. Uh, the applicant is aware that this required sewer impact and assessment fees must be paid in full prior to connection and of the additional cost to extend the city sewer. And upon annexation, solid waste will be provided. Okay. Any questions? No. Moved to item 6.2. Approve the annexation initial future land use map designation, residential low, RL, and initial zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential for 3076 Grandview Avenue. Thank you, Cobb Brotherton, Planning and Development. This voluntary annexation petition involves a 0 0.172 acre parcel of land occupied by detached dwelling. The applicant is requesting annexation in order to receive sanitary sewer and solid waste service from the city. The applicant has paid all required impact and assessment fees and is connected to the city's sewer. And upon annexation, solid waste will be provided. Any questions? Okay. Move to item 6.3. Approve the annexation initial future land use map designation of residential low and initial zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential for 1410 Lime Street. Good afternoon, Dylan Friends, Plan Development. Um, this voluntary annexation petition involves a 0 0.155 acre parcel um, located on the north side um, of Lime Street, approximately 500 feet east of South Hillcrest Avenue, and the parcel is occupied by a detached dwelling. Um, the applicant is requesting annexation in order to receive sanitary sewer and solid waste service from the city. Um, the Development Review Committee is proposing that the 0 0.10 acres of abutting Lime Street right away, not currently within the city limits, also be annexed. Um, the applicant has paid the city sewer impact and assessment fees and is aware of the additional cost to extend city sewer service to this property. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Move to item 7.1 on the agenda. Approve an increase on the purchase order to QTM Inc. of Oldsmar for a pit repairs to the solid waste transfer station. Good afternoon, Mayor. Council members, Kerbin said any solid waste before I started. Could you allow me a quick minute to introduce Mr. Kobe Washington, Mr. Washington drawing? Solid Waste as the Assistant Director is coming to, to us from City of Fort Pierce, second work of Solid Waste. So just wanted an opportunity to present Mr. Kobe Washington Welcome. to the City of Clearwater. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Council Member, um, um, Mayor Council Member, item number um, 2402, approve increase for purchase order the QTM um, Osmond, Florida for a peat repair for the Solid Waste Transfer Station for $137,431 uh, for a combined amount of $227,431. On, on August 23, 2022, procurement issued invitation to bid ITB um, 5222 welding metal fabrication and related services for public utilities. Um, five responsible um, bidders were received. QTM was the most responsible bidder and was awarded the bid. Um, a purchase order was issued on October 17, 2022, in the annual not to exceed of $50,000 for one year with two one-year renewal options. 
In the first renewal of term, the city manager approved an increase of $45,000 for additional work needed um, by public utilities. Um, QTM has agreed to extend the pricing to solid waste which, with the purchase by solid waste. The total amount allocated for, the, for year two for the contract will be uh, $227,431. So the solid waste transfer station are loca located at 1005 Old Coachman Road has two pits used to transfer refuge for, to Pinellas, County's, Pinellas County Waste Energy Facility. Uh, pit two has 12 existing um, steel panels weighing approximately 650 pounds which is pulling off the concrete wall, creating a dangerous situation which requires closing the pit until repairs are done. Pit one also has some two existing panels which is being needed to pick, which is also pulling off the wall. Um, so currently we are, we are functioning only in one pit. Um, this, project will, we, this project will repair both pits uh, to like conditions and provide the city staff with a functioning facility to perform the assigned task safely. Any questions? Yes, sir. Vice Mayor Albert. Okay, well this, uh, this facility, uh, it wasn't really, it wasn't built too long ago. I mean, is this, and I know last uh, council meeting, didn't we approve some concrete work for So, so the, cron the concrete work that was approved for was the transfer station at the um, Hercules facility, the recycling facility. Oh, the Hercules. The Hercules facility. This one is at the transfer station on Northeast Coachman Road. So you're correct. So that facility was built a little bit over four years ago. And the pit, if you could envision it, when the truck, the tractor trailers pulls in yeah. to, pit, to, um, to, uh, to be loaded, uh, the tipping floor, the, the product is pushed down the tipping floor. It's a very narrow channel that the truck pulls in. So as they pulled in, the truck uh, kind of beat back and forth on the sides of that wall and it's kind of damaged the, the, the panels. Oh, okay, I see. So it's a panel, It's a panel, panel between, so you have the truck pulls in that, that narrow channel. Yes. And then there's panels on both sides. Okay. All right, but with this, with this uh, work, we shouldn't have that problem? We were hoping we're not. We we are we are reached out to QTM, which is a, a welding uh, specialist in that field, and we're hoping that they could repair that, and we won't have that issue anymore. We reached out to the to the contractor and the, that put that project together, and we only received one year of a warranty on the on the on the building, so we were not able to to get any warranty work done on that facility. Okay, Councilman Robert, if I can just point out, there there it's kind of a wear and tear situation that's going to be pretty regularly reoccurring. So I wouldn't want to give any false imp uh, impression that this is, I mean, some of us may not be here again, but I suspect five, seven years again, this will be something I think will require regular attention just by the nature of the, the, uh, the, the work that gets done and the, the amount of abuse the walls take from just the service. Well, that's what I was going to ask too. Is there any other type of work that we could do to get it one and done? or at least a further out type of a weld or a new wall or something that you could so, have instead of doing what we already have that we know breaks in five to seven years. So that's part of why we reached out to QTM yeah. to try to put that product back in, in the condition that we're not in this position any further. Okay. And additionally, that's why we went to pit two because the, the product started to peel off the wall instead of waiting until we get to this condition, then we, we addressed it currently. So okay. to be honest with you, that that should have been done months ago. Gotcha. Should, should have been addressed months ago. Okay. Any other questions? We have consent. Yes. Yep. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank well, you. Yeah. You've got item eight point one. Appoint two individuals for the Environmental Advisory Board to fill the remainder of two unexpired terms, one through December 31, 2025, and one through October 31, 2025. Council members, we had two individuals resign from the board. Um, Ms. Lynch and Mr. Thomas had resigned recently. And in the agenda pack, you have seven applicants to consider. Gladys Andrews, a retired principal. Tony Bra Braden Bradenburg, um, insurance agent. 
Jason Drizdy, an environmental scientist, Irina Ford, an investment products support individual, Sonia Jokela, a lease analyst, Patricia Kirby, a vision coach, and um, Michael Rubino, an air quality expert. <coughs> Any discussion among the council and the, the folks who have applied? That's my big shame. Well, first of all, I'm really pleased that there's so many applicants. That was so refreshing. Usually we don't, so thank you to all who have expressed interest. Um, a lot of qualified uh, applicants. There's two that stick out in my mind simply because of their educational background or professional, and that would be Jason Drizd and Michael Rubino. Both have uh, environmental professional experience, quite extensive. Jason Drizd has a bachelor's um, degree in environmental science, previous park ranger. Um, and then the other one is Michael Rubino, who's an uh, environmental expert in air quality. And I actually looked him up, and he's really sought after for his expertise in, in interviews. Um, and he's an expert in uh, microbial uh, science. So those two, to me, stand out. Any other comments? Vice Mayor Albert? Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll make a, a motion for uh, Mike No Rubino. motion today, but Can't if there's that. consensus on one individual, we can do that. Okay. Otherwise, we can wait till Thursday. All right. Uh, is there two openings or one? Two. There's two. two. That's two. right. So I, the only thing I would really need from, from you is if there is consensus on two individuals, mm -hmm. Okay. What terms you would like those individuals to, to serve in? Oh, I see. So the first one is through December 31st, 2025. Okay, so you want me to put forth If you want, uh, if there's consensus for the two individuals, then, and I can, I, I can adjust the agenda item for Thursday for okay. consent. So if there's I'm, consensus. I'm support those two. I agree, we did have a lot of um, applicants, so thank you if you're in the room um, for applying. I too, on my little list here, had Jason um, listed because of his experience and Michael, or Mr. Rubino as well. So I uh, definitely agree with that assessment. I concur. Yeah, I feel the same um, in reading uh, the qualifications. It was quite impressive for, the, for this list and nice, um, nice to see and I don't have an issue with either of those two gentlemen. I did have an interest in throwing uh, Gladys Andrews named in solely because uh, as we went through uh, zip codes there is no representation uh, down on the beach or sand key um, and I think having uh, we do have a lot of professional experience in the environmental side of things um, and that seems to be covered pretty well but having that uh, citizen side that lives on the beach would be the only reason I would throw that third name out there but I am supportive of those two. So we have consensus on the two, right? and that, that's all you need from us today. Yeah. It doesn't matter who serves what. Can we leave it up to them? Well, no, I, I need, it, I need to yeah, adjust have, the agenda okay. item, okay. so I can go by alphabetical and have them, I can have Mr. Driz serve through December 31st, 2025, and Mr. Rubino through October 31st, 2025. That's talking a few months. Sounds good. May I place it on consent? Mm -hmm. Yes. You agree? Okay. 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 Move to item 8.2. Appoint an individual to the Community Development Board to fill the remainder of an unexpired term through February 28, 2026. Council members, as you are aware, we had an opening, a vacancy occur on the CDB uh, with the election of Mayor Rector. Um, in your agenda pack, you have applications from Two individuals who meet the desired qualifications, and that is Louise Cerna, Louis Cerna, um, planning consultant, and Charles Uslander, uh, construction project manager. And then we also received applications from the following individuals. Mr. Jonson, a retired project manager and elected representative, Jessica Martin, real estate investor, and Michael Mastrocerio, promotion and marketing sales VP. Any discussion? Thoughts? Ideas? I mean, I'll, um, I'll, I'll jump in. I think 
again, looking at the list, it's, it's nice to see and seeing what we have existing. We do have uh, a lot of really qualified professionals on there. I think through the campaign process, we were hearing a lot from our citizens um, about truly wanting balance in here and balancing the importance of our economic development side um, with some of the neighborhood issues that have gone on. Um, I, I think that, you know, obviously two names on here that are on a list is not meeting the desired qualifications, but are definitely uh, would bring knowledge and balance first is Mike Mastrosario. Um, has a definite passion uh, for economic development in our community and not just the downtown area, but also has a passion uh, for our neighborhoods. Uh, and the other one, obviously, is Bill, Bill Johnson. Um, feet those two, but uh, I, I say my Master Sario uh, really brings balance as, as well as that passion to that development side. He also represents a zip code that um, is not at all included. I mean, we have three right now at 33759. But 33756 is not, there's no representation, so that would be a great addition as well. So I'm in support of Mr. Masters Ariel. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, I like Mike for the position too. Yeah. And I just want to say, you know, I had a chance to serve for two years on that board, and, and I do think, um, I mean, there are a number of candidates on here who would be good, but. Um, Mike, Mike Mestisario brings, I think, um, you know, he's had years of business experience, so he knows restaurants and build out and some of them, some of the issues that come from the business side of it. But, but Mike also has the, the um, he, he just was involved in a campaign where he canvassed and he talked to all the neighborhoods throughout Clearwater too. And I think he's as on top of all the issues that, that uh, are concerning to Neighborhoods and residents as well. So, so uh, I would I would support Mike for that this position. So I guess all five of us agreement. Yep. I placed on consent. Yep. Okay. Move to item eight point three. Appoint council members to regional and miscellaneous boards. Council members in your agenda pack, I have all the regional boards. Some of them have been updated. Those that have a term listed is because it actually has a term. Otherwise, it is for the one year that you agree to uh, today or on Thursday. So with that, I've, hi I've also highlighted those, air those boards that need uh, an appointment. So there's a vacancy. The first one is the audit committee. Um, that was being held by um, Mayor Onx, but it's not necessarily one that requires the mayor to serve on. Has the mayor traditionally served on that one, though? No? It's whoever wants to serve okay. on it. Well, the mayor has other things that uh, he's serving on that um, some of the other mayors recently have not. So. Anyone here that's interested in doing that? Mr. Romano? No, I'm just asking, um, <laughs> just for, for clarification. Uh, are we going through these individually single on every opening? Is that how we plan to approach this? Or? If it's easier, I can just go over highlight today and we can discuss it on Thursday if that's easier for the council. Yeah, because I can, I mean, for the sake of efficiency and moving forward, I, I can agree um, for consistency to fill um, every vacancy that C3 council person sat on. Um, okay. And if, if our colleagues would, you know, agree with that, I don't have a problem filling those. I know that would leave, obviously, a handful of others uh, on the other side for C2. Um, and we can check with the gentleman's calendar regarding that. But Can uh, you go over what those are? Because I think some of them are mine. I Could won't steal your boards, I promise. <laughs> um, I, I, I can. I think um, I just sat on uh, the Affordable Housing mm -hmm. Advisory Committee, and usually hand in hand with that is the Homeless Leadership Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, second would be Suncoast League of Cities. Third would be the Tampa Bay Estuary Policy Board. Uh, I know WorkNet Pinellas Board is not mandatory, but I would like to, to keep a representative on that, and I, would, I don't mind being that. Uh, and then obviously I said the Affordable Housing Committee. I also went through this list um, and would be able to fill the majority of Mr. Bunker's positions um, with some scheduling conflicts coming up with Tampa Bay Estuary Board. I do 
uh, work that next meeting, but um, I do see there's alternates here as well. And he was an alternate on that board. Um, and then the pension advisory committee. Let's see, I can just start at the beginning. Uh, the Courtney Campbell Scenic Highway, I can take that. Uh, School Transport Safety Committee, the alternate for the Tampa Bay Estuary, um, alternate for Tampa Bay Regional, and the Pension Advisory Committee. What about Big C? He was the alternate on Big C. So the Big C. Fourth one is mostly mayors, right? Yes, I was the only one that was. I'll, I'll do Big C. You'll is do Big C? Okay. Council Member Dick Shade has said that her experience that's all, all the Mostly mayors. mayors, yes. So who, um, Vice Mayor, do you want to do the alternate for Big C then? I, I could do the alternate, but I just wanted to, the reason I had my hand up was uh, I didn't see Ford Pinellas on here, and I know that it's on the governor's desk now to give Clearwater another representative on Ford Pinellas. I'm page it's, two. It's on there. Ford Pinellas. Until, they're no, until they notify us of the additional appointment, um, it, it's not listed yet. Yeah, there's going to be, yeah, there's going to be two, mm -hmm. and, and that's a monthly. And when, that, when they notify me officially, because with that one, actually the council has to make the recommendation to the county, and then the county accepts the. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. But it's on there. I just want to make sure everybody knew that. Do you have anything you want to add? I'm all set by six. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, yeah. Obviously, want to be a team player, but trying to work with schedules. Yeah. You guys know how that works. So. Um, Mr. Mayor, just so I understand, and I'm not stepping on your toes, did you want the Tampa Bay Estuary Policy Board, or do you want to just fill it as an alternate? No, I can take it if you want to be an alternate for it. Perfect. I won't be able to make the next meeting, though. Well, I'll, so. go. I'll go as your alternate. My guy. What was that? I'm sorry. That was uh, Tampa Bay Estuary. going to say this Tampa Bay Estuary okay. Policy Board and Menino as uh, alternate. Okay. Yeah. And these are all the other things I want in each one of them. That's, that's the thing about that. Okay. Anything you want to add? No. Okay. Take helpful? Good? Okay. Okay, that will move to item 9.1. Mayor, this is my item uh, 9.1. Uh, there's not really a lot to say beyond what's stated in the agenda item itself. Uh, part of being a city attorney means that uh, we have to deal with lawsuits. And so, um, you know, for the most part, most of our lawsuits are relatively predictable uh, in the sense that, like any city, we're going to have slip and falls, we're going to have car accidents. Um, you know, that's kind of par for the course. Uh, but uh, then we get into unusual lawsuits, and this one is a little bit unusual with a plaintiff who has a long history of uh, litigious actions. I don't want to say too much beyond what's in the agenda item since we are in a public meeting, um, but I will disclose to the council that this 25000 is just getting us started in the litigation, so uh, I won't have to budget for this next year because this litigation could go on for some time. Um, that's my problem to deal with. I will budget for it appropriately, but I want the council to know that this is an unexpected lawsuit and uh, we'll just deal with it as we have to. Questions from Mr. McGullis. <clears throat> Do we have consent? Yes. Yep. Unanimous. Move item 10, the city manager reports. Nothing, sir. Okay. Move to item 11, city attorney reports. Nothing at this time. Move to item 12.1, council member Tixia. So I'm giving you a copy of um, some information. So I'm on the uh, Opioid Abatement Funding Advisory Board. I was um, the alternate, but then I just inherited. And so I just wanted to give you a glimpse of some of the important findings that uh, we had uh, of a opiate task force data review. There's a lot of information, so I'm going to leave it up to you to read it. However, I do want to um, just kind of go over some takeaway points. So, um, on the whole, according to the uh, 2022 annual drug report, we are seeing trends going down for opiate uh, overdoses. However, fentanyl is on the rise. 
Um, the data is not always captured because, of course, you know, there's some that are not reportable. It's, it's very hard, but most of them are, are reported from uh, emergency departments in the hospitals in the, um, in the county. And then when looking at Florida and dividing it into counties and looking at the overdose annual uh, numbers per 100,000 people, Unfortunately, Pinellas County is in the red, which means it's the highest incidence, but there are other counties that are in the green, which is the lowest, and we will, um, we are going to enter in conversations with them and work with them to see if we can replicate those, um, those results. We are looking into, again, digging deeper into the information and coming up with um, an action plan. So, there's a little bit of good news. There's still a lot of work to be done. And as you can see, we have a lot of support. If you look to page 18, the, the number of partners that we have are very impressive and they're actually growing. So I, I have hope. And so our next step is to capture uh, more detailed data, uh, including other states for to form recommendations. And then we're gonna uh, come up with an action plan and hopefully turn Pinellas from red to green. And I will keep you guys abreast of, uh, of our progress. Okay? Yeah, so let, uh, just, just let me say on this, this issue, um, I had a chance to uh, attend the Clearwater Rotary meeting where the U.S. Attorney um, spoke, and spoke directly to this issue. And, and really the crisis we face here, not just in Pinellas County, but throughout Florida. So I really appreciate, and I'm sure the other council members do too, your involvement in this issue and your participating because it's a, it's a very critical issue to Clearwater. We have, uh, we have, we have a significant problem with particularly fentanyl in this county and, and that uh, impacts Clearwater greatly. So we well, greatly appreciate your involvement in your leadership on this. Thank you. I, I'm impressed with some of the strategies that they're that they're focusing on. They're not just focusing on overdosing and overdoses and decreasing it, but they're actually being really, um, I think, forward forward thinking. They're like looking at programs that support pregnant and postpartum women, neonatal abstinence syndrome, warm handoff programs and also treatment for the incarcerated population so we can head off that. So um, I'm really impressed with how extensive they're, they're reaching out. So I'm hoping that the results will be seen soon. Thank you. Any, any council members have questions? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly thank you, Lena, for um, jumping in and being involved in this. Um, I think so many in our community, uh, family, friends have been touched. Uh, by this crisis, and it's not just in our backyard, this is nationwide. Um, it gives me um, some reprieve in knowing that you're on top of this and you're on this board, and I know how passionate you are for your causes, and you will um, put Clearwater in a good place to hopefully lower and drop some of these numbers. Um, and that's a serious note. On, on a funny note, uh, I greatly appreciate your presentation and your delivery of this package. Uh, and the ribbons that you tied on it. So I know my colleagues feel the same, so thank you for As that. As the only woman on the board, I feel pressure <laughs> to, uh, bump, to uh, you know, put some estrogen in, in, on, on this diet. So I think, the, I think those um, uh, folders are pretty, are pretty, aren't they? They are. <laughs> and you have the nicest signature on the PSTA board. <laughs> <laughs> Mine not so much. Hers, hers, hers is the best. Vice Mayor Albritton. So, yeah, I just had a question, Lena, on this uh, green area. Is it include Dade County or is Dade above that? Uh, hold on, let me look at my thing. That'd be my idea. You know, I'm not quite sure because I, I didn't check if 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 that was. It's Monroe or Dade. Yeah, that's right, like, that's I'm not quite sure. But I have a funny feeling that it's just specific to the county. The way it's divided is just county. Yeah. But I'm not, like, one thing that really jumped at me, I mean, it's right next to Miami. It's right yeah. next, it's, it's still port, it's still the same access, it's the same. What are they doing specifically? I mean, they're literally surrounded by red. So 
um, that's going to be interesting to, to have those conversations with that county and see what they're doing so, so different that their results are so, um, so drastic and so positive. Yeah, I'm going to look into that. Thank you. The other chairs, um, the impact of opioid abuse to all of our city departments, all of our city employees, whether it's first responders, obviously, have to deal with a lot of this directly. It impacts a lot of other city departments and city employees as well, too, that they have to deal with folks who are struggling for different reasons. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a cost to the citizens of Clearwater in, in uh, not directly addressing this issue. So appreciate your taking leadership on it. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, with that, uh, we'll move to item 13, new business. Items not on the agenda, but uh, they can be brought up for discussion at a future meeting. Okay, with that, we'll move to item 14, closing comments by mayor. Um, you know, there, we've, had, um, we've had uh, lots of news stories the first two weeks that uh, three of us have been sitting up here, and me in particular, and um, you know, some of them not all positive, but I've shared with media, and I just want to share with you all here again today that, uh, uh, you know, I can be more positive every time I talk with the media, and, and I never want uh, something that's perceived as being a negative story to overshadow the great things we're working on and the great work our staff is doing throughout the community. And so every time I get asked about a controversial story, um, and I have been asked several times this first two weeks, I respond that I couldn't be more excited about the future of Clearwater going forward and our ability as a team to move forward. And, and I don't say that because I'm trying to spin it a different way. I say that because of uh, some things that I saw just this weekend. And I know during the campaign on Neighborhoods Day and uh, other council members shared with me that they had the same experience. So many residents were complimentary of our city staff, our city employees, all different departments. The way that they had touched or they had done something positive in their neighborhood or community and, and great work and compliments throughout the city, every department. And so we don't ever want to forget that. And then this weekend there were a number of activities and I have to see several of the council members there at uh, some of the, the activities that we had this weekend. We had a lot of them. Uh, but two that stood out, uh, we had this incredible dog challenge down in Coachman Park. And I didn't know much about it until I got over there. I knew it had something to do with television. But it's going to be a nationally televised event on NBC, uh, I think June 14th of the broadcast date. So uh, it, it, it was the real deal. They had a beautiful setup in Coachman Park with water in the background. And it was a spectacular setting for, uh, for television and certainly for uh, the weather couldn't have been any better. So everything just kind of came together in the right way. But uh, so I had only intended to be over there for maybe a half an hour. I, I stayed for four hours or so. I mean, I, I got one of my best days as mayor. I got to spend, you know, four hours with dogs and put the medals of the, do of the winners, you know, around the dog's necks. And just, I had a great time. But, but more than anything, I had a chance to talk with the, the television people. The camera people were there. And they, uh, they, some of them were from Tampa Bay. They do network television events, camera people for all kinds of things. But some of them weren't. They were from all over the country. And they just went, gushed over how great our venue was for their event. And one of the things they really complimented us on was the turf in Coachman Park. For, you know, it's, it's an elite. These, these folks were qualifying for the national competition, the national championships. And they commented over and over again about how great that our turf was down at Coachman Park. And granted, we only put it in 10 months ago, so it should be you know, fairly nice. But we've had a lot of weather, and we've had a lot of things, activities down there that could have destroyed it. And so that was a testament to our parks and recreation team that gets down there. And the intent. we heard earlier about how they have folks assigned to several different parts to take care of it. We put millions of dollars in of an investment of taxpayer dollars into that park. It's important to keep it nice. And I was so impressed at how they were impressed with how we had taken care of it. 
So I complimented several folks down there with the Parks and Rec Department on that because it was really great. And then, uh, you know, it's like I said, it's not all Parks and Rec, but, you know, there's all things that all of our departments are doing great throughout the community. But the other one that stood out was last night at the final night of the Pier 60, um, the, um, the Sugar Sand Festival. They had a uh, salsa night and uh, Orchestra uh, Infinidat was there. Uh, and that place was packed. It was, it was lively. It was people stayed, you know, had a day at the beach and then stayed through the fireworks at 9 o'clock. Uh, it was just a great and a, a very diverse community event. And, uh, you know, our Parks and Rec working with them to make that event happen and then have the creativity to bring, bring that kind of night to the final night was just impressive as well. And, and again, people around there, a lot of visitors. I met a lady who was brought um, to uh, Clearwater on um, the Kelly Clarkson show. She had won some contest. So she came here from New York City just because she won the contest on the show to be here. She just raved about her experience here in Clearwater. So, uh, and that's, like I said in the beginning, <laughs> it's, that's not the two weekend Mayor Bruce Rector, that's all of us as a team working to make this city better. And those are the two things I just want to point out, the many things great that are happening in Clearwater and we want to make sure they keep happening in Clearwater. So with that, um, I will adjourn the meeting of the City Council Work Session. <laughs>